Welcome to our Estra industry sponsored webinar today. Uh, today we're talking about continuous anesthesia, a fit for all technique. So my name is uh, Ash Gupta um, and I would be the moderator today and one of the speakers. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to be here with my co-host, uh, Dr. Clara Lobo, who I introduce uh, shortly. So thank you very much uh, to Payank uh, for sponsoring tonight's webinar, uh, which is titled as Continuous Panel Anesthesia, a fit for all technique. Uh, I can have the next slide, Clara. So this is a non-CME webinar. Uh, please uh, use the Q&A feature for all questions. A uh, certificate of attendance uh, would be available and you can email marketing at piyank.com. Uh, now this webinar is being recorded and uh, uh, it will be available on the YouTube channel as mentioned. Next slide. Uh, that's me and uh, uh, Clara who will be the speakers for today. Next slide. So we do not have any disclosures, uh, no financial interest or affiliation uh, concerning material discussed in this presentation. Right, uh, so as an anesthetist, we are very well versed with the technique of spinal anesthesia and use it in, in our daily practice routinely. You know, however, for various uh, reasons, continuous spinal anesthesia is still a very underutilized technique. Today, we discuss this very useful technique in detail along with my co-host, Dr. Clara Logo, who is a consultant anesthesiologist at Hospital uh, Des Vacas uh, Armadas in Porto. She's a specialist in regional anesthesia and secretary for Europe Society of Regional Anesthesia and a highly regarded speaker at national and international meetings. About myself, as I'm a consultant anesthetist at Queen Elizabeth Hospital Gateshead in Northeast of the UK. I'm a board member for Regional Anesthesia UK with major interest in regional anesthesia, obstetric anesthesia, patient safety and education. So we would want this session to be interactive for, for you with plenty of opportunities to ask questions. So use the Q&A uh, uh, section to ask questions. And hopefully uh, we would aim that you should start using this technique uh, uh, more routinely in your practice for the ben benefit of our patients. And of course, the environment, as we all know, region is the cleanest form of anesthesia. So over to Clara, who will take over from me. Thanks, Clara. Thank you, Ash, for your kind in the, in, uh, introduction. And uh, thank you so much. I want to uh, welcome all, everybody who is attending today. I hope this session would be uh, helpful for you. It was sure great fun for me and Ash to do it. Uh, we interacted a lot during the last week, you know, to prepare uh, our topic. And also thank you for Pajunk for being interested in also educational issues and uh, allowing us to share our experience with you. Well, our topic will be about continuous spinal anesthesia, who, when, and why. We will present you uh, two cases along this presentation where there will be some questions that we will uh, ask you to kindly to answer and help us out to uh, understand also your thoughts and experience with this. So these are the objectives. We will run through uh, each one of them briefly. And uh, also, of course, we will be happy to answer your some tips and tricks uh, or questions or doubts or whatever you want to ask us. Well, what's the continuous spinal anesthesia? Well, as you can see, is uh, the, uh, the placement of a catheter on the spinal on a, a space, on the subarachnoidal space where the cerebrospinal fluid is. And uh, using that catheter, you can deliver some uh, drugs. In our case, in this case, would be a local anesthetic and uh, some other adjuvants that you might want to use as well. And uh, in very small doses, you can uh, actually get a very consistent homogeneous block, um, considering the lower half of your body. Okay, it's just a brief history of uh, what the continue about uh, the, 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 the use of this technique. It, you can see it started really early, more than a hundred years ago with Dean, who was a surgeon who used a real needle placed in the intrathecal space. And through that needle would inject uh, the local anesthetic. Uh, more or less 30 years after, Lemon, also a surgeon, who uh, developed or used um, a malleable needle 
And uh, this needle would allow him also to keep the, and use the um, uh, rubber tube and uh, the in injecting through uh, the, this catheter, he would manage, you know, to keep the anesthesia running. I will show you in a little while, you know, quite ingenious uh, way that this uh, colleague of ours um, managed to um, perform this technique. Uh, finally, using a urethral catheter, not a needle, do we also started to do this technique uh, five years later. And in um, uh, 1987, Hurley and Lambert started using the microcatheters with uh, the um, uh, gauge of 28 to 32. And later, soon later, uh, Riegler uh, described the Caudet Aquinas syndrome after the use of these microcatheters. Um, there was an advice um, uh, from FDA against the use of these small catheters. Although back then, um, most the, 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 it was agreed that the, probably the reason would be the, the toxic dosing or the toxic uh, concentration of, of high dose local anesthetic very close to these very sensitive structures that are the spinal nerves. Finally, uh, Arkosh uh, in 2008 described this technique for labor analgesia. Well, now I want to share with you uh, what Lemon, uh, what we call the Lemon mattress, used to keep his um, technique. In fact, you can uh, search on uh, the PubMed and you can see that he published quite a few um, cases, uh, you know, uh, considering the use of this technique. Uh, he has two papers. One of them he uh, describes the performance of this technique in 500 patients and another one in 100 patients. They, they were not only dedicated for uh, or uh, performed for lower limb surgery, they also uh, used it for, he also used it for uh, abdominal, abdominal surgeries. So it was in 1907. Well, let me introduce you to the the first case, so this is actually a real case I had last week. And uh, this is um, uh, an 84 years old man with a periprothetic hip fracture. And he was very fragile. I, I will share he, with you his uh, clinical history. He was a uh, longstanding diabetes, type two, uh, hypertension also. Uh, in 2009, he had a myocardial infarction with a coronary bypass. And after that, uh, he also uh, was submitted to uh, back surgery and uh, also bilateral total hip arthroplasty. Well, um, previous, so he was, he needed uh, to be on surgery because, because of a fall, he got this periprothetic hip fracture. As you can see here um, on, on the x-ray here, I can share it with you. We, he did an MRI for that. And uh, you can see also his BMI, he's very thin, very frail patient. Uh, and uh, the surgeons were anticipating a very long surgery because they would have to remove um, the femur aspect of the prosthesis. And that would mean, uh, you know, a very long, um, very long, uh, surgery and also uh, difficult because uh, it could be, you know, it could be a um, cause of uh, very severe hemorrhage. Uh, okay, so here I also share with you what was the, um, the drugs he was taking for his, his uh, pathologies. So, uh, and anti-diabetic, anti-hypertensive, and also some protective uh, medication for his heart. Um, also, he was previously active, although his activities were very light, so we would not, it would be difficult to uh, understand exactly how his uh, MET status would be. Uh, considering these light intensive activities, I calculated with a very low um, intensity um, that he would be able to uh, handle and uh, he was also living in a nursing home. Um, 
as you can see here also, um, due, due to his um, problems, not only medical, but as uh, also surgical, we were anticipating a probable uh, difficult airway, uh, difficulties in evaluating his med status, uh, his cardiac condition that would not be uh, ideal, and also the risk of unpredictable epidural spread due to his back surgery before. Also, my hospital, we have an uh, intermediate uh, unit, but not an ICU that could be uh, used for postoperative care of this patient. Well, now, please, Ash, can you launch the... Um, the query, okay. so, uh, so I will. So there is a okay, stop sharing. We have oh. okay, so that's okay. So this so. is where I ask you to please send us your uh, opinion about this case. Once the let's say relaunch poll, uh, hold on. Okay, next study will start. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, that's right. I'll well, we'll wait a few seconds so you can. Yeah, I can see people are interacting now. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we've got a few more seconds happening, 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 nearly, nearly, nearly. Uh, yeah, yeah. What's going on, actually? <laughs> Can't stop. Yeah, yeah. It was just, uh, actually, yeah. you can see how many people are responding. So. Uh, no, pretty much. Uh, we have got three, nearly 400, and we have got 240, 247, 250. Oh, I can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think uh, it's slowing down. So I'm going to I'm going to stop this now. So and okay, she's already stopped it. So yeah, so so, so I think you have the. Uh, the poll, can you see, uh, Clara, at all? Yes, yes, I can see it. So your major concern would be your hemodynamic instability. Well, that was also my major concern. Yes, That's associated funny. with the duration of surgery also. Yeah, okay. What would be yours, Ash? Yeah, no, absolutely, I'll agree. Uh, you know, so, and that, that's exactly where, where the, the spinal comes into play now. So because of instability, what best we can do considering the, the, the pre perimorbid conditions of this patient and mm -hmm. the limitations what we have for the post of uh, and care in terms, yeah. Okay. So could you launch question number two, please? Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's the next, next uh, poll is there. Yeah. Can you see how it's coming up? Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. Yes. So responding very nicely. So thank you very much for your interaction. I think that's the, the, the whole idea of this of this webinar, so we can interact. Right, okay. No, oh, it's interesting. Wow. It's very interesting. Yeah. All right. 375, 71%. So I think stop now. So okay. uh, we can share the results here. So yeah, do you want to? So, so it's, it's really interesting that people have, uh, you know, the, the GAs are, are not many compared to continuous spinal and CSC, which yeah. is really, really, really nice. So very close, the, the results, right? Yeah. Very close. So people would prefer, you know, uh, the continuous uh, the CSC. CSC. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Well, let's keep going. Yeah. No, I think you can share the results. I think that's it's, that's been. Yeah, you, you, you can you can close the window. Stop sharing now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. That's fine. Right. Okay, so let's, uh, so this is what I did. <laughs> Quite obvious, I think. So this is what I did. Uh, I, I used um, the continuous spinal uh, and, uh, and anesthesia. 
that I, it's a, a technique that I'm quite comfortable doing it. Uh, and uh, so I used also this um, kit that you are, I'm showing here. It's a 21 gauge uh, spinal needle and that you can introduce a 25 gauge catheter. And uh, you can approach uh, with a needle just like a regular single shot spinal. And uh, when you find the, um, the place, when you see the CSF flowing, you can introduce the catheter. It will in be introduced very easily, without any resistance. And um, it, uh, I, usually I don't put more than three centimeters. Uh, you have to wait a little bit in order to see the spinal fluid you know, flowing through the catheter. And as soon as you see that, you, uh, you place the filter and you aspirate in order that you remove all the air that's inside um, the, 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 the filter. After that, you just, uh, you know, uh, tape the catheter and be sure to label it clearly that it is a spinal catheter. I use uh, some light sedation also because the patient asked me, he was not very comfortable to be wide awake. And, uh, you know, the close monitoring that I refer here uh, is, sorry. Okay, so uh, please, we will ask for your, um, for your opinion now again with the new question, please, Ash. Launch pool, yeah. So, so at this moment, we want to know your opinion about which local anesthetic would you prefer, or solution in case that you were you, you would prefer to use with an opiate. Right. Okay. So you would prefer local anesthetic and with an op a short acting opiate. Good. Yeah, that's fine. Can you share the other one? Okay, it's been shared, I think. That yeah. Ended, yeah. Okay. So the next question is yeah. Okay. Oh. Wow, it's going quite fast, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's good. I think that's nice. <laughs> Learn track nicely. Four hundred plus. Yeah, I think that's that's, okay, what that's about, about right. Yeah, that's what you expect. Okay. Okay, so let me just uh, move on. Okay, so this is what, what I did. Uh, before induction, we, uh, I administered a tranexamic exit and then uh, with the sedation and also uh, we, um, we, uh, I started with the monitorization. Let me explain a, li a little bit what I used, uh, the standard and also EEG monitoring because of a sedation, uh, cerebral oximetry. That's what it means, C-O-C, uh, urinary catheter and uh, a non-invasive hemoglobin. At the beginning, you know, my first choice would not to put, um, um, in a direct uh, ten uh, arterial tension measurement. Um, but um, so I, after that, I started a CSC induction with five milligrams of levobopivacaine, 0.5. And then I would, my plan would be top up as needed with 2.5 milligrams. Uh, 
one thing that is very important, and uh, we usually use this uh, technique, it's quite common in, uh, in, uh, in where I work, and everybody knows, and I repeat it again every time we have this type of case, is that I am the one person that manages the catheter, you know, that injects the local anesthetic or whatever is to be injected in the catheter, only myself. Um, so what? Uh, let me tell you what happened. So he lost more or less um, 500 milliliters of blood, and uh, uh, we. I, I didn't. I never needed ephedrine to be used. He was never unstable. His uh, uh, blood pressure was never under 100 milligrams uh, milli milligrams of uh, mercury. Uh, uh, systolic, never. And uh, I didn't use any opioid. Uh, the fluids I used was, um, I gave him a pack of red blood cells because uh, he was very frail. He is true that he had 11 uh, of, of hemoglobin, but he was also a little bit uh, concentrated. So I prefer to inject, to give him uh, blood and some uh, saline. Uh, one liter of uh, saline, some light sedation. His um, saturation was close to its starting level. And by here is the SpO3, I'm sorry, it's SpO2, the oximetry of uh, cerebral oxygen oximetry. And his urinary output was more or less five, 50 milliliters per hour. So the surgery had a duration of three hours. And uh, as you can see, my total um, local anesthetic used was 10 milligrams of levable pivicane. And for the postoperative uh, analgesia, I, so I planned a multimodal analgesia with, and I after uh, did a femoral uh, nerve block and the lateral cutaneous nerve block. At the end of surgery, the catheter is removed with the patient still in the room, in the OR. So this is our standard of care at the moment. So here we can discuss a little bit why to consider this a CSC. I present you uh, here my, um, you know, my, my reasoning. So I intentionally perf performed the CSC because we could anticipate that could be a difficult airway. I also thought that the, um, due to his spinal surgery, there could be uh, some deformity or the, the local anesthetic spread in the epidural space could not be homogeneous and might give a, um, a, a heterogeneous block. And I would also need more uh, quantity of local anesthetic in the order to you to have that type of, um, you know, of deep uh, motor and sensory block due to his uh, cardiac disease also and the prolonged surgery. Well, the obesity is not the case in this patient, but it could be the case because, you know, obese patients, uh, usually uh, we have more difficulties to place uh, an epidural catheter and also surgeries have a longer duration for obese uh, patients. Um, uh, also, another uh, positive uh, advantage of this technique is the slow titration of the sensory level, and you, you also give time for the um, nervous, the sympathetic nervous system of the patient, you know, to you know, adapt to this new, to this um, block that is starting to to be placed. Um, you can. Uh, 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 inject, you know, uh, slowly uh, the, the local anesthetic and wait for the result. And you don't have to give a very high dose at the beginning. I, I would not advise you to do that. I would advise you to actually go slow. Um, the fact that uh, we uh, use this local, this uh, catheter, you, you know, in this particular patient, I don't think the dural the postural puncture headache is an issue. And um, also, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to, to manage, uh, in fact. Uh, well, 
I, another aspect uh, that it was not used for this patient is uh, in case that you need for uh, an abdominal surgery that I have also had the experience and the abdominal relaxation is really optimal. Um, the hemodynamic stability was very, it, it's good. I never needed to use any uh, sympathetic, sympathetic mimetic drug, you know, to, in order to keep uh, the, the, ten, the, the blood pressure uh, stable. And um, it's very safe, very easy to use. And also you can use it for post-operative analgesia if you have uh, experience with that and the, the staff that is managing this patient is also experienced with that. Well, now, Ash, back to you. Yeah. So we're just taking all the questions and trying to uh, come with that. <laughs> right. Okay. Now that was a lovely presentation. Uh, thanks, Lara, for sharing all that. It's, it's really, really interesting. Uh, right. So the second uh, case uh, which we're talking about uh, is uh, use of uh, the continuous spinal anesthesia in labor. Uh, so rather than a case, I would discuss uh, uh, this as not as I would discuss this not so uncommon scenario, which most of us who do obstetric anesthesia would have faced sometime in the clinical practice. So a young parturient uh, who requested a labor uh, epidural analgesia as an unintentional dural tap. So what do you do in this scenario? So can we have the poll please? So does everybody have the poll? Uh, so what do you do when you do uh, unintentional dural tap? Uh, I'm not seeing any response for some reason. Uh, is the poll on live for, for the delegates? Uh, poll is not showing. Okay, the poll is not showing apparently. Uh, uh, right, I think, uh, okay, it doesn't matter. Is the poll visible to people? Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll talk through. So basically, uh, so the options we have is the remove needle until dry tap, place intrathecal catheter and use it place intrathecal catheter and abandon technique and try again another interspace. Uh, so uh, I'll stop this. I think we can keep doing the next, uh, so Clara, you can move over. Uh, the poll seems, doesn't seem to be working. Nobody's getting uh, any answers. Okay, fine. Right, so Clara, can you move the slide? So the next next question is uh, again a poll. So what are the major concerns if you leave intrathecal catheter? Uh, so the options are we have the concerns are PDPH, posterior puncture headache, drug error, cord equinus syndrome, or total spinal. So these are the four concerns which uh, which people can have. Again, can you, can you see it, uh, Ash? Yeah, I can see the poll, but uh, I cannot see it being response by people, so I'm not sure if the audiences are seeing the poll at all, because there's no- Well, uh, try to launch it yourself, because I'm getting, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not doing it right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I think, I think Nick was doing it, so- It was Nick, running so well. Okay, yeah, okay. Now, now it's coming, now it's coming, right. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> no, no, Nick, Nick was doing it. Right, okay, now that's, that's interesting. Yeah. So most people can see uh, are worried about drug error, uh, yeah. the final uh, PDPH and cord equina. Yeah, that's great. We can end the poll and we can sh share the results. So yeah, okay. drug error rightly it is probably the, the most uh, uh, concerning thing for, for majority of us, which is, I would agree with that. 
and yes, total spinal cord equine and, and uh, to mm. headache is always there. Right, we can stop sharing that. Okay, and we can move on to the next next slide, please. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so personally, what what we would do is personally uh, in in our in our trust and in the hospital, and what I would do is I would feed the epidural catheter in the subarachnoid space and use it as a continuous spinal catheter. Uh, I would label the catheter and establish who tops up the catheter, because that is very important. Uh, in our in our hospital and mostly in the UK, the practice is for the duty needs it is to, uh, to top it up intermittently for labor analgesia. Now there is some evidence that if the catheter is left uh, uh, over 24 hours, the risk of PDPH is reduced. However, in our trust, we take it out post delivery. We don't leave it uh, uh, post post delivery plainly because of the risk of uh, uh, complications like uh, drugs giving accidentally. Now, every procedure has its risk and benefits, and we should be guided by the best interest uh, of the patients. Uh, so, so I can move to the next slide. Thank you. So uh, this sort of uh, table guides you whether you should use intrathecal catheter or not. So if there is a familiarity with the technique, uh, it, has, uh, it has been a difficult epidural, uh, patient near delivery, a non reassuring trace, uh, the intrathecal catheter is the way forward. Obviously, otherwise, if, if, we, if the unit is not familiar with that and if there are safety concerns, then the best is, is to recite the epidural. Uh, however, you know, people have to be aware that whenever we recite the epidural, there's a risk of second dural tap is always there, which can uh, worsen the situation. Uh, next slide, please. So, how do we want to use the intrathecal catheter? Uh, now, every unit have their own protocols uh, and things. So, so if we talk about labor analgesia, uh, depending on wherever you work, uh, mostly the epidural bag mix can be used for analgesia. So we have a uh, uh, 0.1% uh, BPV cane. So we can use two to three mils of the, of the low dose mixture uh, to, to top it up uh, for, for pain relief. Now, ideally, uh, it's 2.5 milligrams of BPV cane with 25 mics of fentanyl, which can be used as intermittent boluses. Um, it varies how often it could be sort of 60 every 60 minutes. And obviously, if it is safe and familiar, a continuous infusion of the bag mix, uh, depending on what you have, uh, up to three mils an hour could be considered. In our unit, uh, we don't do that. We don't think it's very safe because our midwives would be very happy with that. But again, that's something which could be done if you want to avoid uh, intermittent boluses. Now, for any reason, if the patient needs to go to, to theta, which could be for a section or for anything else like PPH or you know, uh, removal of placenta, uh, surgical anesthesia can be easily obtained uh, with the working continuous spinal anesthesia or intrathecal catheter. So uh, we use uh, uh, liver PPV cane 0.5%. So you can use a preservative free 0.5% BPV cane, uh, one mil uh, with fentanyl. Uh, and obviously this can be followed up uh, with that uh, further doses of 0.5 mil of 0.5% BPV cane every five minutes till the desired uh, level is obtained. And, and that's the beauty of, of continuous spinal anesthesia that uh, you know, with, the, with the slow titrated effect of, of, the, of the spinal, uh, the, the hemodynamic stability is very well maintained as nicely explained by Clara in a previous case. And also if the case does go prolonged for whatever reason, you're not limited uh, by the single dose spinal. So you can easily uh, 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 prolong this anesthetic by using uh, the further doses of uh, a local anesthetic in the spinal. So I'll, uh, Clara, you can take over from there. Thank you. Okay. So, so here also, you can go on if you want. This is also um, okay. Fine. Complications. So, so I know that there were questions coming about about the dual puncture headaches uh, and cord equina cases uh, and other things. So. Uh, as Clara mentioned in a previous uh, uh, slide, uh, earlier, earlier slide, that there was a risk of cord equina, uh, and then uh, uh, it, it, the FDA banned the microcatheters in 1990s in America. Uh, so I think there were a lot of studies done, and the main reason which suggested the risk of cord equina was uh, people were using 5% lignocaine uh, with microcatheters, 
and with with the head down position the concentrated low concentric was being pulled in 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 the quad equina region uh, which is uh, probably what caused uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the nerves to, to get damaged uh, if such a high concentrated uh, la uh, and that's the reason uh, uh, the the contest spinal anesthesia sort of went out of favor fairly quickly at that time but since then, uh, people have been using it on a fairly regular basis, and there have been steady uh, case reports coming out in the literature, uh, putting case series in, in high-risk patients uh, uh, where it has been used very successfully. Now, th th there is a, a, a available kit, spinal kits available in the market. Now, not many uh, countries have it uh, or access to it. Uh, so people have used uh, epidural catheters uh, as as intrathecal catheter or to use a spinal uh, uh, for spinal anesthesia. So this is a table, which you can see the first table, table two, which talks about the incidence of a posterior puncture headache. Uh, as you could see, the catheter gauge used is, uh, is, is uh, 20 gauge. Uh, and there were a couple of studies, uh, and I, Denny suggested less than one person headache. And also important to remember, as Tara mentioned, is the age group. Now the risk of headache after 60 years is pretty minimal. Mm -hmm. in plenty of case series uh, in, in studies. So after 60, the risk of headache goes down to minimal. So, uh, so in my practice, I use 18 gauge epidural catheter, uh, 18 gauge epidural needle with 20 gauge catheter, and I haven't seen headache. So this is the study which suggested uh, less than one person headache. Having said that, Liu uh, it had an incidence of 9.2%, which is, I don't know, but that's what it is in literature, and we don't have any more studies since then. Uh, so, the, so essentially, the the headache in elderly patients after sixty is minimized. Uh, coming back to cord equina cases, we talked about the cord equina, which uses five percent uh, lignocaine hyperbaric, which probably caused uh, those cases uh, which are mentioned here. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, other other complications, I mean, uh, uh, so there's a risk of catheter breakage, uh, uh, failures. Or cannot be threaded. So I think the risk of failure, I'm sorry, uh, unable to thread the catheters and catheter break are probably much higher in micro catheters. Uh, so personally, I use a 18 gauge uh, epidural needle 20 gauge catheter, which seems to be all right. We don't have had any issues with that. Obviously, Clara uses uh, uh, the, the spinal cath, and I'll let Clara to talk about that. Well, uh, in my experience, we didn't have any problems yet. Uh, but uh, honestly, I, I never tried the 27 gauge catheter. Uh, I prefer to use the 25, the 25 because you know the main the main concerns about it is threading. It could it can be difficult. In the 25 gauge, you you saw in the video, it was not very difficult to thread it. But the 27 is a little bit more. It's it's very thin, so I think it would be more difficult. And uh, another aspect is the injection pressure. So it would be, uh, in, it, it's, it's considerate. Uh, I, I cannot explain, but um, exactly, because it's a very subjective feeling, but you can actually, uh, if you use uh, syringes bigger than uh, one milliliter, uh, I use, I use uh, you, you no know more than a two milliliter syringe. My preference goes for the insulin syringes. And um, if you use, more uh, bigger syringes, you will be you will experience a lot of difficulty in injecting because you will feel a lot of pressure. Uh, so in 32 gauge catheters, I can imagine that will be even worse. Uh, so, uh, well, for my experience, the 25 gauge catheter is just perfect. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't go for the 27 gauge. And uh, well, you can see there also that the, the incidence of the posterior puncture headache is, well, except for one study, is not, um, you know, uh, it, it's more or less similar to our spinal, um, single spinal uh, uh, punctures for, uh, for a spinal block. So I, for me, it's not the major concern, but of course the age issue is important. Well, I'm, I'll move on to the next slide now. Okay, so here is just a, a summary of what we have been saying. Uh, now I added, uh, we added the unintentionally, when you unintentionally uh, go through the, 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 the dural membrane and actually um, do an unintentional 
um, spinal uh, placement of the needle, of an epidural needle. And of course, you can have the uh, advantages is the immediate analgesia and also avoid a further dural tap. Uh, another advantage that for me, I didn't include it here because I don't think it's, it, it could be quite, um, it's not very consensual. It's to leave the catheter in for 24 hours in, in order to reduce the incidence of the, of the, the posterior puncture headache. Um, because, you know, that means that you would have to leave the catheter in and uh, it would be, an, in, you know, a, re a reduction in on safety for that patient. Um, when I, I, I don't do a lot of obstetric cases right now, but uh, when I did before and uh, this happened, we would leave the catheter in for 24 hours, but we would in, in utilize the catheter. And I, I explain, we would give a nut a very tight nut on the catheter. So it would be impossible to inject whatever because it would not be possible because of that nut. And we would leave it there for 24 hours. And also very, you know, uh, everybody would know, everybody involved in the care of that patient was aware that that was a spinal catheter, not an epidural catheter. So not meant to be used at all time, at any time. Okay, so the issues with small gauche catheters, in, you know, to keep up our discussion, because they are very difficult to manipulate, very difficult. There is very high resistance to injection. The failure also can be high because, you know, when you, they enter the spinal space, you don't know exactly how they behave. If they, uh, you know, follow the path that you, uh, you want, or if they, you know, just curl uh, close to the, to the needle tip. Um, the Caudé Equina syndrome associated with microcatheters, well, we think that is mostly due to the accumulation of local anesthetic toxic doses. And um, but you, you can also think that can be some trauma uh, because they could, you just, because they are very thin, you know, um, be, be placed in the, in the dural sleeves very close to the, to the, to the nerves and cause some damage. Uh, mechanical damage. Um, the caudal direction of the catheter is associated with the high failure. So I, in, in a while I didn't mention, but uh, usually I thread it cephalically. And uh, so here again, conflicting that uh, about leaving the catheter intrathecally in more than 24 hours. Well, it was my experience back then. There are not, I don't think there are more much studies uh, addressing this uh, this issue, but well, back in those days, it was like um, five years ago, I would not be, it, it was it was established that we would leave it there in, in, in when we were, uh, when, when the, this issue of the headache was a, a concern. So considering the post-operative pain management, there is some uh, studies, you know, um, advising it the, for their use or, you know, the, uh, sharing their experience. Uh, but there are some issues that you should be aware of because uh, if you are using a, an infusion pump, you should actually know the, 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 if, if it's a reliable uh, equipment. And it should be uh, also instructions that who is managing in the, the, the syringe, the equipment, it should be uh, only for the anesthesiologist team. The rate of accuracy is also important. So um, you should also check that when you use the equipment. And, uh, you know, don't forget, there will be um, the concerns of error and human error of connection or uh, preparation of the drug. Um, so routine off-label use of those devices for CAC is highly questionable, unfortunately, and um, specifically designed pumps might help in reducing the risk of the administration failures. However, uh, this is not a very popular technique, so maybe we can be a little bit, um, we would not be expecting that some specific drug pumps would be developed for this kind of technique. 
So the kits available uh, now that we know of is the spinal catheter for the B. Brown and the interlong for the Pajunk. Uh, the differences between them is that um, the catheter for the Pajunk uh, kit is uh, through the needle and uh, the catheter for the B. Brown would be uh, outside the needle. Uh, the difference is uh, on the whole it provokes and how the catheter will, um, you know, uh, adapt to that hole. Um, but I don't think this should be much an issue, honestly. Uh, there, there is some difficulties, uh, you know, when you want to, uh, in, to put the catheter using the spinal cath because you have to put your hands in a way and your fingers in a way that the needle will not uh, back out, back in, go in the catheter when you try to puncture the dural membrane. Uh, but anyway, I, I used both. And uh, when you get your expertise, when you get experience, you can overcome all these difficulties. Uh, well, I, we would like to share you some tips and tricks. So uh, get use your equipment that the equipment that you are familiar with. Uh, try to avoid very small gauge catheters because I think it will give you more problems than advantages. Uh, more or less uh, use four to five centimeters of a cephalic sp uh, um, spread uh, thread of the catheter. Don't put more than five centimeters. That would be my advice because you never know how it will behave inside the intertical space. Um, don't forget to aspirate the CSF in order to remove the air from the catheter and the filter. There is the that space that you need to consider. And also when you are injecting the local anesthetic, uh, consider that space um, to know how more or less how much dose you are injecting actually in the intertical space. So I would advise you also to use small and graduate syringes. The insulin is excellent, the insulin syringe. Um, if you are using the epidural kit, um, there's no specific kit available. Maybe you can use a pediatric epidural catheter. Uh, it's a 24 gauge, but uh, you, know, you, you don't always have it. Unless you do it intentionally, you would not be prepared to have these epidural catheters. Um, remember the dead space again, and uh, you can again prevention of this of this headache can um, you can leave the catheter. Some others are injecting salines before removing the catheter, but you know this is not uh, evidence proved. Um, for me, the major issue here is um, the clear identification and instructions of who man manipulates the catheter, especially if you are sending these catheters to the wards that I would not advise you to, honestly. Um, I want to share this um, video with you. It was, it's a great video. Uh, it was really released, uh, just released a few... Um, a few weeks ago during the Blocktober um, initiative of, the, of, Duke, of Duke's uh, group uh, lead by Jeff Gadsden. It's a really nice one. You, it, it can explain a lot of, the, of this technique, uh, the advantages, the disadvantages, and also explaining a lot of tips and tricks. Um, I loved it, so I think you should, you should give it a, a try also. Um, well, finally, well, is this the continuous spinal anesthesia haute couture, or should you just look at it and uh, like a Zara <laughs> equipment? So I think honestly is underused. Uh, of course, it's not for all patients, but I think more patients could benefit from it. It's very robust and very versatile. Um, it should be very well carefully labeled and also again the manipulation intraoperatively and postoperatively is a major issue. Um, give precise instructions for drug administration and also can provide you postoperative analgesia if you want to prolong it for the postoperative period. But forget, don't forget that there's the risk of infection, the risk of motor block 
and there could be also the risk of management and uh, dosage. I think it, we there is some still some room for further technical advances uh, to increase safety of the patients. And uh, I am sharing here with you some literature review that you can also, if you are interested, and uh, you can um, you can check these um, these publications that I'm. I will leave a little bit so you can, if you want to take a photograph or you can also, I think uh, Nick told us that this would be also recorded and available on Bajun website. Well, and uh, this is, this was the end of our presentation. I think we can, I can, I can give the floor to you, Ash. Yeah, so we have plenty of questions as expected, and I'm, I'm trying to catch up on all of them as much as I can. I've answered a few as okay. much as I could. So I'll just uh, uh, I'll just start off with a very interesting. Somebody uh, mentioned that uh, okay, I'll, uh, that uh, they apparently they didn't use it anymore because three out of seven cases the the catheter got lost, uh, got melted from the tip, and they got lost after three hour surgery, which I find it very odd. Uh, it hasn't been reported. I'm not aware. Uh, no. Nope. Uh, so, so I, was it micro catheter or a regular epidural catheter? So I'm just reading. It's it's uh, it's a spinal catheter department where spinal catheter melted inside the surgery. Uh, withdrawal of catheter tips were left in the spinal fluid, as was not possible to take the catheter out. So I'm assuming it's it's a micro catheter. Uh, so uh, that's the reason they they have banned it. So so that that's that's one thing. I think majority of the questions are they're asking about you know uh, about how do you flush it. So do you flush the dead space uh, you know, when you're giving the drug? Do you aspirate? So maybe we can just clarify that. Okay. Uh, well, the, the the way I use it is uh, when when I place it, you wait a little bit in order to have the the the, the presence of uh, the CSF and the on the tip of the catheter on the the end of the catheter on your uh, distal end of the catheter once you do that you uh, uh, put the the rest of um, the kit you know the locking um, gadget and uh, the filter and then I aspirate in order that to uh, reduce that dead space with the CSF and remove the air. Once I do that, you know, uh, you can you need to calculate the dead space. So I know already how much milliliters is the dead space of the catheter, and it's one milliliter. And so I inject one milliliter of local anesthetic, and I just wait uh, like three to five minutes, three minutes to understand if there is some response of the of the patient for example in this case the patient had a fracture so he was experienced some pain when we would manipulate the leg so after i injected the the first milliliter of local anesthetic we tried um, with the alcohol a swab with uh, 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 to put pass on on the skin of the patient and he would say he would feel, you know, not the cold, but it was a little bit warm. So for us, it was a sign that the block was running. But still, we tried when they were positioning the patient by the, the by the surgeons, he would it's, he would feel a little bit uncomfortable. So I gave him a little bit more of uh, 2.5 milligram, milligrams of levobopivacin. That means 0.5 milliliters, and. Uh, we waited uh, five minutes more or less, and uh, the patient was very comfortable. They could manipulate the leg and he would not feel nothing. He would not feel pain. He would, could not move the, patient, the, the, the leg. So he was, uh, he was okay for, um, for them to, to start the case without any complaints from the patient. So for me, that was enough. And uh, after that, when, you, you, when the case goes uh, continues, you can understand if the patient is a little bit, uh, he was lightly sedated. So he would, uh, we would say, I'm starting to feel something. So that would be for me the sign 
to give a little bit another bolus of uh, 2.5 levobuvacaine. So this is how I handled it. And more or less is, uh, is how I handled the other cases that I have been uh, experienced with. So I agree, it's more about titration. You know, as long as you can uh, account for the dead space uh, and mm -hmm. then just titrate one minute at a time and see, see how the block is coming. Right, so uh, the other thing is a lot of questions about the post-op management. Now, personally, uh, for a continuous spinal anesthesia, which I use for, for the high-risk patients, uh, I take it out uh, immediately after, after anesthesia. You can add some, some painkillers, uh, you know, opioids, if you want to, uh, but I don't mm -hmm. leave it post-op. So, Clara, do you have a view about post-op? Well, usually uh, it's not my preference also to, to inject opioids in the, in the spinal fluid. I can use it as, as an adjuvant for an intraoperatively, but not for postoperative analgesia in terms of, uh, for example, morphine. I don't, uh, I, I cannot remember the last time I used intrathecal morphine, honestly. So it's not usually my regular practice. Yes. Yeah, so I prefer for a multimodal analgesia. And, you know, for this case, it was a very distal, um, uh, well, it was a proximal part of uh, the, the, the first third of the femur that was involved. So I prefer to do a uh, femoral nerve block and the lateral cutaneous nerve block. The patient was going to be lying down, so he, they would not start uh, an early deambulation. So the motor block associated with the femoral nerve block was not an issue. So that was my preference. And uh, I do it a single shot technique. Right, and then again, uh, this question about how far do we put in? I mean, as you said, you would put around four. So I think, uh, yeah, around four centimeters is about right because there's a high incidence of paresthesia because uh, if you go further in, you can uh, touch the nerves, which can cause paresthesia. It's been reported 17% incidence of paresthesia. So obviously you stop when the paresthesia is coming. Uh, so yeah, three to four centimeter. Yeah, and, uh, no more. I, I, I put a little bit more, just one centimeter more. I go to five if uh, I'm dealing with obese patients. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And also somebody asked about how do you direct it, uh, it cranially because we don't want it to go cordially, they want it to go cranially. So how would you do that? Well, you, you have to be, well, you know, you have to trust that the catheter will flow, will go uh, where you put the, the, the bevel of the needle. So I, I introduced the, the, the needle uh, with the bevel parallel uh, to the um, to the spinal cord, and then when I get the CSF, I just turn the needle. You know, just I, I inject it like this, and then turn the needle in cephalically, the bevel. So, and then I thread the catheter this way, and uh, hope that it will move. You know, cephalically. So that's that's yeah. how I try to do it. Yeah. But you know, the more in local, the more uh, catheter you thread, you know, the more uh, you, you wouldn't control its, um, you know, the the direction he takes. Uh, what level uh, do you prefer uh, when you do the spinal catheter? Well, it really depends on uh, on the anatomy of the patient. Uh, normally, I don't go for for a spinal catheter that I want to do a spinal catheter, I don't go above uh, L2. But my preference would be L4, L5, L5, S1. Somebody asked about ropivacaine. Can we use ropivacaine? What concentration? I think 0.5% probably should be all right. Yeah, well, normally we use, in my, in my institution, uh, we are used to live with ropivacaine, so that's my preference. But also we have uh, hypobaric um, bupivacaine or isobaric bupivacaine also. We can also use that one. Um, normally for this particular case, we can also use um, heavy bupivacaine, but I would prefer heavy bupivacaine for abdominal procedures because I think uh, it would be easier to manage the upper level of the block using um, a heavy uh, local anesthetic. You can control better, especially with the positioning. It, it would give you more control of it. 
So, so in terms, yes, yeah, so another question about about uh, uh, baricity. So I think with the, with the his, his historical problems of uh, hyperbaric uh, uh, with uh, with mm -hmm. equina, I think the key is that if if you're given some certain local anesthetic and and if it is not the block is not coming, that's where the risk is that it's it's getting uh, uh, you know it's going into the cord equina space. So if you have given a couple of mills and the block is not coming, then probably it is getting uh, uh, in the cord equina and that's where things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. So just to be aware that I think preferably uh, high, uh, isobaric is probably okay, but if it's hyperbaric, you have to be careful how the spread is coming. So that would be my my take on that. But uh, yeah, obviously if I don't say you want a higher block, uh, so that would be preferable. Yeah. Uh, so I will just uh, finish the questions with one last question. So people are asking like in what procedures and where, where you can use it. So uh, personally, uh, uh, like uh, electively, I would use in higher risk patients, which are mostly the, uh, the fracture neck of femur patients, uh, which, are, uh, which, have, which could have a lot of uh, respiratory comorbidities where you don't do a GA. At the same time, they might have uh, uh, cardiovascular comorbidities, even like aortic stenosis. Uh, where where GA again can cannot be the you know could be a, a tricky option for them. So the most advantage of the of this technique is your blood pressure stays very stable. You can try to the technique nicely, and you can avoid post op uh, care and critical care, which is okay, quite important in the current time when you're with COVID patients around. You don't want to be sending uh, trauma patients to to uh, critical care if you can avoid that. Clara, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Well, for, for the abdominal case uh, patients, I agree with you in everything you said of considering the patients, uh, the conditions and, uh, you know, the stability of the block. And also I would like to uh, share some other experience that I have uh, with, this, um, with this technique, not only for uh, lower limb uh, surgeries, but also for abdominal surgeries. And uh, we, I, we have been doing some um, abdominal laparotomy, um, especially those patients that come very unstable and uh, need to do an emergency surgery. And, uh, you know, patients that I have some pneumonia or um, uh, pul pulmonary problems like uh, the POC, um, sleep apnea, uh, they are very obese or patients that are very difficult conditioned. Um, sometimes uh, these uh, patients uh, that need these uh, uh, emergency procedures cannot wait to be stabilized for their medical condition. So, uh, you know, you, you do your best and this, this, uh, this technique has been proven to actually um, help us a lot. And uh, I refer specifically on these last few months to COVID patients that needed um, a laparotomy. And uh, this was our preference. And uh, actually it saved the day because the patient got surgery and he didn't need to be intubated. He didn't go to the ventilator. And fortunately, you know, all went well. So um, I would like to just remind you that this could be used for a little bit more uh, extensive surgery in terms of the upper level of the block. And all those patients, I would use, you know, the bupivacaine, heavy bupivacaine. I would never advise you to use the lidocaine, never. Okay, so there might be some uh, cases of uh, caldequina syndrome associated with bupivacaine 0.5 heavy, but even, the, it, but it's not that common. It's a, a rare complication, so. It's a big question, somebody says, uh, 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 epidural versus continuous spinal. Why not, epi why not epidural compared to- Okay, so why not epidural? Because you will need, well, you, you don't have that dense block. You know, you, don't, you, would, you wouldn't have that dense block. You would need a lot of local anesthetic uh, dosing. And some patients, you know, the epidural spread might be a little bit erratic. It's not consistent. It's not, you know, as trustful as this one is, in my opinion. Of yeah, no, I would, I would agree. Absolutely. I mean, that's what most people say. Why not epidural? I think uh, the, the, the control of the, of the block, 
the hemodynamic stability uh, and, and the predictability of, of, the, of the block is much better with spinal compared to, uh, to, to uh, epidural. Right, I think we'll have to stop there. We've gone over time. Uh, thanks a lot for everybody for interacting and asking these questions. I've tried to take as many questions as I physically could. I've tried to answer a few of them as much as I can. I know there are lots of questions. Uh, so we have our Twitter hand handles there. The, the webinar will be recorded. So feel free to get in touch. Uh, we will be more than happy to answer you know, in, on Twitter or anything if you want to ask anything specific. Yeah. Thank well, you, you can you can use you can use our um, our Twitter also. Yeah, yeah. You can you can you can tweet in uh, you we we gave our we gave you our handle. So if you have any questions, maybe we can help that. Yeah. Well, right. bye. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Clara. Thanks. Thanks for. Thank you, Ash. Bye. Thank you.